Okay, so we are two past the hour and I see we have uh, yeah, we'll more than 10 ahead. people, so it's a good time to start. So uh, thank you for attending to the CPSH seminar today. We are welcoming Kirk Scanlan, uh, who, uh, is, uh, who received his PhD in geotechnical engineering in 2018 at the University of Alberta in, in Canada. And right after that, he moved uh, for a postdoc here at UTIG in Austin. Uh, during which he did work uh, a lot on uh, radar processing and anal analyzing, especially in the, the Europa Clipper team for the Reason Radar, the Reason Radar Sondo. And then he moved last year uh, over the summer to the National Space Institute at the Technical University of Denmark for uh, another postdoc fellowship. And uh, where now his um, is using uh, spaceborne radar measurements to uh, to study the the surface uh, of the ice caps, especially of Greenland uh, and the and the fern and the snow uh, at the surface there. Uh, so you see that Kirk has been, he specialized in data processing and analysis of radar measurements, especially with radar sonders. Uh, he's been, he, he did address, uh, he did target a lot of different planetary bodies, he's working on Earth right now, he's been working on Europa, it's still working on, uh, on Europa, and today he's going to go, he's going to present something about Mars. Uh, Kirk did receive, while he was at UTIG, he received a CPSH award to work on this uh, exact topic he's going to uh, talk today, which is mapping buried Martian lava tubes through orbital radar sounding. It's your turn, Kirk. Okay. Thank you, Sir Owen. Hopefully people can see these slides. Yes or no? Looks good. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you for having me here today. And as Sir mentioned, this is work uh, funded through the 2021 uh, Center for Planetary Systems Stability Seed Grant Program. I worked on it at just the very tail end of my time at UTIG. And uh, yeah, it's really nice to get a chance to talk about this because I don't get to spend much time in outer space anymore. I'm usually can, confined to Greenland these days. So yeah, I'm just going to talk about... Uh, a different way of trying to map buried Martian lava tubes through orbital radar sounding. So kind of the motivation for this work and kind of the who cares is um, lava tubes have been uh, long considered to be a key to assessing the past and future habit past current and future habitability of Mars. So they're environments that offer natural protection from ionizing radiation, ultraviolet light and micrometeorites. So if you're thinking for past indication of Martian life, these are kind of all more pristine habitats where things might survive a little bit longer as opposed to being on the surface. If you think about currently uh, current uh, habitability of Mars, probably going to end up somewhere in the subsurface. These, uh, these environments offer a unique way to access the subsurface without having drill in from the surface itself. You can go sideways. And all these... Um, these same properties then have, and have impacts for future human habitability of Mars or colonization. And there's these ready-built shelters that are sitting right there for uh, people to exploit if we so choose to. So taken together, it's, all, it's really important that we have an idea of how to map these and see where they are, how far they extend, so that we can leverage them in the future. So just going a little bit for or talking a little bit about how this is currently done. There's two main ways and both of them involve looking for uh, skylights. So these are areas where the roof of the, of the cave has collapsed and uh, then we can start to see in it. So one way is using visible, visible imagery and looking for overhanging shadows, which is illustrated here. You can see these shadows and they give a sense that, okay, this cave opens up um, as you, for more than what we can see. So that's a, one way to see skylights. The other way is, using, is looking for diurnal thermal anomalies. So this is a uh, cave in a pit chain. During the day, you don't really see much uh, expression of it in the thermal imagery from uh, Themis. But at the, in the night, you can really see this bright uh, thermal anomaly. And that's just because the 
portion of the mar or the atmosphere inside the cave is a little bit warmer than the atmosphere above the surface, so you get this nice little thermal anomaly. So that's kind of the conventional way for mapping these uh, types of features on the surface of Mars. But there's been a lot of interest in trying to get, trying to do this with Sherrod. And uh, for those who don't know, Sherrod is the uh, radar sounder on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, 20 megahertz center frequency, 10 megahertz bandwidth. And for people who may not be as familiar with how radar sounders work, uh, it's uh, pretty simple. You have Sherrod up in orbit around Mars on MRO. It emits some electromagnetic energy as a uh, chirp as a chirp waveform. And that just reflects off different contrasts in dielectric permittivity at the Martian surface and within it. So for a long time, people have tried to leverage that kind of, uh, those, those reflections that we'll see to try and get a sense of, uh, to see if we can see different types of Martian latitudes. So this is one example from Perry et al 2019. And they just uh, explored Sherrod waveforms over known cave systems could be modeled using a one-dimensional three-layer subsurface model. So you just have a uh, rock roof, you have a free space void representing the cave, and then you have a rock floor. So then you have that three-layer system with all the dielectric primitivities that are implied by it. And then you just put that through a uh, Sherrod signal emulator and compare that with what we actually observe. So this is uh, some mapped lava tubes. Uh, and I'll get to a little bit later because I looked at the same region. And then here you can just see the results. You have the Sherrod wavelet in black, so that's the observed. And then just the different uh, expectations of what you would see for different types of uh, uh, lava tube geometries. So different uh, depths, so different roof thicknesses and different chamber sizes. And you can see that it's really tricky to say one works relative to the other in this one dimensional approach. Uh, another study from uh, Bartabilius et al. in 2020 said, okay, instead of saying, let's look at the integrated response, let's see if we can actually see individual reflectors from either the ceiling or the floor of the cavern. And they didn't have much success with that method either. So to date, no study has been able to conclusively use Sherrod observations to detect or map Martian lava tubes. But it's still, it's one of those holy grails of what people would like to use Sherrod to do, but we just haven't figured out a way to do it yet. So what I thought about, so the idea I presented to the, in my CBR proposal was to not focus on a one dimensional approach, but kind of leverage the two dimensional scattering nature of these, the, what we assume to be the two dimensional scattering nature for these uh, lava tubes. So if you think about how lava tubes will reflect radar energy, they're gonna look like a, almost a point target in the subsurface. So this is kind of conceptually what'll happen when you don't have a lava tube, Sherrod's just flying across and just gonna get reflections from the surface as normal if I don't have any subsurface anomalies. But if I put a lava tube in there with the broad footprints that Sherrod has, even though I'm not over the lava tube, I'm still gonna get some energy back from it. And as I move across, that's going to make a, a uh, conventional or an idealized like point target response. So is there any way we can use this point target like nature to infer the existence of these lava tubes? And so point target response and kind of recombining energy from uh, recombining scattered energy from point targets is the goal of synthetic after radar focusing. It's a common data analysis technique that's used for radar sounders on, for Sherrod and Marsis, for Clipper, for Cassini's uh, uh, radar, and all the work UTIG does in Antarctica and the Arctic, all use SAR focusing as a way to recombine radar energy scattered from point targets and improve our spatial resolution. And how much energy is recombined from that point target is a function of the aperture length. So how long our synthetic aperture is. If we have a long synthetic aperture, we're going to recombine more energy as opposed to a short one. So this is just a, an example from a paper we published last year um, showing what uh, star focusing essentially does. We have the range compressed on our corrected Sherrod radiogram at the top. This is from the Northern Polar Layer Deposits of Mars. You can see all this nice layering in the ice. 
and then just with star focusing with two different aperture lengths. We have our short aperture here, really emphasizing the flat lines uh, surfaces. And then we have our long aperture here that uh, gives us a better spatial resolution and kind of picks out these uh, more point target dipping uh, reflectors. So this is something we wanted to uh, try uh, leveraging to look at these lava tubes. So if we have a short aperture, we're gonna get some surface echo power. But if we start increasing, making our aperture longer and longer and longer, we're gonna start recombining more of that energy uh, that's scattered from the lava tube. And then that leads to a change in the echo power that then we can detect and uh, use to look for lava tubes. And just to say that this isn't a completely out of the, out of the box idea, it's a, almost an inverse concept to what Dusty Schroeder uh, did for flatline water bodies under Antarctica when he was at UTIG as a postdoc. So he was looking for these uh, distributed canals, these flatline water bodies. He was interested in uh, areas where you have stronger power at short apertures as opposed to long apertures because uh, these flatline water bodies don't scatter energy as kind of these more um, complex subglacial features will. So it's kind of, it's almost the inverse of what he did. He was looking for flatline flat line bodies. We're looking for point targets, but essentially it's uh, leveraging the same type of uh, radar scattering phenomena. So that's kind of the hypothesis I put forth in the um, proposal is that the locations of near surface lava tubes and caves are to present with a positive power differential when we're comparing Sherrod surface echoes produced after star focusing with two different aperture lengths. So I will take the power from the long aperture relative to power from the short aperture. And if that positive, and, and if that difference is positive, if I have that positive, positive power differential, then I'm gonna say, okay, that's a more point target likes uh, feature exists at that location. And uh, we made, the study makes use of the delay Doppler star focusing code that we published uh, last year. So the study area I selected is the same as that Perry, uh, Perry et al. study from 2019. It's the western flank of Alba Mons. So this is just the area right here. Alba Mons is uh, just off to the side. It's kind of nice because we have all these nice mapped lava tubes as reported in this uh, Crown et al. 2019 paper. And if we compare that to kind of the Sherrod coverage in this area, there's 107 Sherrod orbits between December 14th, 2006 and April 13th, 2017. And it's a really, really nice uh, area because of the strike of these lava tube features. They're almost orthogonal to the Sherrod data acquisition. So they strike east-west where Sherrod basically is in a polar orbit. And you can, uh, you can think that we're gonna maximize our point scatter, our point target like response just because we are orthogonal to the strike of these features. So it's a really neat uh, kind of, uh, neat area where things just line up well for this type of two-dimensional study. And this is just, a, so this previous map is a, is a themis base map. And this is just what the area looks like in Mola. So this is a Mola hillshade uh, illuminated from the top. You can see it has some, it's not a very smooth area by any means. And you can just see the coverage of the, uh, Sherrod track or the, Mar the MRO tracks on top of that uh, base map. So kind of the methodology we uh, I followed was I range compress and SAR focus the raw, the experiment data records that are produced by Sherrod or downlink from Sherrod for the area of interest. Uh, range compression and atmosphere correction was done following the standard approach um, from Bruce Campbell in his 2014 paper. And then we used our uh, SAR focuser. And then I have to pick the surface uh, from the two different sets of radiograms that I produce. And I, because a long and short aperture will move energy around in slightly different ways, I allow over there to be some variability for an individual sounding. I say, I'm gonna define my surface as the point of maximum SNR. And I allow for up to a five sample difference between the short and long apertures. If the peak power is not within five samples, from the two different uh, aperture results, I'll just reject that pick and I won't, I won't consider it as a valid surface pick. If it's less than five samples, I'll just say, okay, this is saying, I'm gonna say this is the same surface. 
and then we'll move on. And then the final step would be to compare the difference in extracted surface echo powers and their spatial relation to lava tube segments. So you do all this for those 107 Sherrod uh, orbits, you extract those positive power differentials, and this is kind of the map I get. So this is just the location and amplitude of these positive uh, radio surface power differentials plotted on top of the kind of uh, the Themis interpolated uh, base map, or sorry, uh, Themis interpreted, not interpolated, interpreted base map, and then the Mola hillshade. And for my short aperture, I show six kilometers. For my long aperture, I chose 40 kilometers. It, I don't think the size makes a huge difference. It just one had to be short, the other one had to be long, and they're scaled approximately to what uh, Dusty used in his paper, kind of accounting for much different geometries, but roughly order magnitude scaling. And we're just going to look at some uh, different areas. We're going to start with the red, uh, the red rectangle, and then we're going to look at the green one, which is just south of that. So if you start zooming in on some of these, you can see that it doesn't not work. So you can start to see that where we start, where Sherrod starts crossing some of these interpreted lava tubes, they do pop out with positive power differentials. So you can see tracking kind of this uh, yellow feature. Hopefully everybody can see my mouse. Um, tracking yep. along some of these, okay, good. <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. So tra tracking along some of these, uh, uh, interpreted lava tubes, you can see where we start to cross them, we do start to see, as, ex as we hypothesize, some positive power differentials. It doesn't work all the time. You can see there's, no, there's nothing here. We have some areas where we pick out positive power differentials, but there's no interpreted lava tube. So, but it's not, it doesn't seem incredibly random. If we look at the area just to the south, it's kind of similar. Again, as we start coming across uh, some of these features, especially this yellow uh, interpreted lava tube right through here, is about every Sherrod orbit that crosses it, we get a positive power differential in approximately the same location, which is a really neat thing to see. But again, we have some uh, in this region where we have positive power differentials with no interpreted lava tube. So, once I saw this, it was kind of a question of, okay, how do I figure out what I'm seeing? Or are, is this really doing what we're thinking it's doing? Or is this just some type of uh, coincidence, essentially? So I spent a lot of time trying to combine different types of optical imagery. So high-rise, CTX, bringing in the Themis data, Themis data itself, trying to load all those together, go at a very small scale, go like point by point, see what I can see, but it's really hard to put all these measurements in context against each other. So what I ended up doing is I said, okay, the question I want to know are, are these locations of positive power differentials spatially associated with locations of interpreted lava tubes? That's ultimately the question I want to get. Or am I seeing some type of happen, just luck? Is, is this random? So I designed a very, a very crude uh, test for randomness, kind of a pseudo Monte Carlo approach, where I say, okay, I know how much of my, uh, how much of each orbit comes out with a positive power differential, and I know, I know that for every orbit. So then I could say, for each orbit, I could say, okay, I'm going to put those positive power differentials randomly and some random configuration keeping the same amount of my orbit though it has this same positive power differential. Then for every random, for a random assortment of positive power differentials, I'm gonna determine the distance, the ellipsoidal distance to the closest interpreted lava tube segment. That'll be zero if they're overlapping. And then I'll rinse and repeat that a bunch of times to try and build up a set of statistics for the uh, for random set of positive power differentials. So I did that 2,800 times. And this is kind of the result. These are the 2,800 random simulations, kind of the cumulative probability a positive power differential is within some distance, some ellipsoidal distance of a lava tube. So how to read this plot is say like, okay, 90% of my positive power differentials randomly placed are within 60 kilometers of a lava tube. 
or say 65% or within 25 kilometers. And this is the result with the actual observations. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna zoom into this very, uh, this very uh, small window where we're very close to these uh, lava tubes. So you zoom in and this is what the results look like. So these are probability that you're within 10 kilometers of a lava tube segment. And then we can look at different smaller ellipsoidal distances. So say it's uh, within seven kilometers. We see kind of, if I were random, I would expect maybe like 37% of my positive power differentials to be within seven kilometers based just on a rough mean. But actually our observations are way out here. So not something we would terribly expect. At three kilometers, we see a thing. Our observations are much more likely to be near these lava tube segments than if they were randomly spaced or randomly positioned. And at one kilometer, very similar. So what this is telling us that the, the observed positive uh, radar power differentials are always more likely to be observed near the locations of interpreted lava tubes than if they were randomly positioned. So that's kind of, that's a good thing. We're not seeing something random. There's something systemic that's bringing these, or there appears to be something systemic that's bringing these positive or co-locating these positive power differentials with these interpreted lava tube segments. But they're not, it's not uniquely so. As you see, we only saw like one in five or 20% of positive power differentials lie within one kilometer of an interpreted lava tube segment, kind of comparing the rough uh, co-location of all these measurements. But it's important to remember that our hy the hypothesis was that power differentials are thought to be associated with point target-like features on the surface and the near subsurface of Mars. Lava tubes, though, are only one example of something that could be. We said, we thought like, okay, uh, maybe there are only lava tubes. But we saw from the, uh, the Mullet Hill shade that we actually have a lot of topography in this area. And there's a lot of ridges. So are these positive power differentials only picking up the very peak of these ridges that are almost behave like point-like targets? And it's also important to note that these interpreted lava tubes what they are actually morphologically is they're, they're not really the idealized one where you have a flat surface with a buried lava tube underneath or even a, a, uh, a pit chain. These are, uh, these have been interpreted to be collapsed segments, collapsed segments on ridges and volcanic ridges. So in just within the name of these things, we are looking at ridges that as uh, that have been interpreted to be lava tubes. So we did, okay, so let's do the exact same thing but with ridges. So we know where our lava tubes are. Now let's look at the spatial association between these positive power differentials and ridges. So we went back to the MOLA DTM. Here's the hillshade map again. And then just looking at uh, the curvature in the MOLA DTM, you can kind of really kind of pick out where these ridges are. You also see a lot of uh, craters pop out a little bit more too. But then you can say, okay, I can, I can define where these ridges are from the curvature. So that's what we did or that's what I did. And these are just locations along those 107 Sherrod orbits where I've said arbitrarily like, okay, this is a ridge. I, I'm gonna interpret it based on this threshold of curvature. I'm gonna say, this is a ridge. So then we again do a, our poor man's Monte Carlo assessment. And this is the result for the, the uh, cumulative probability that our positive power differentials are some ellipsoidal distance from a ridge. And you can see this is a much, uh, the spatial affinity between the positive power differentials and ridges as extracted from MOLA is greater than what we observed for lava tube segments. You can see we had to get up to 60 kilometers before we were at 90% of our positive power differentials were near a lava tube segment. Whereas here, we only have to get 20 kilometers away. So there's a much finer spatial affinity. And we can, again, we can look at this, uh, this, uh, very close to the very start of this with less than 10 kilometers. So again, we have all our Monte Carlo simulations and then the actual observable and the width of black line. So again, looking at uh, the data for individual uh, sort of distances. So you can see our observations compared to the randomly placed positive power differentials. At three kilometers, we do get a little bit of separation that we tend to be closer more likely to be close to ridges than if our uh, the positive power dif differentials were randomly spaced, and again at uh, one kilometer.
So as with the lava tube segments, the positive power differentials are around closer to molar ridges than they would have expected if they were randomly located. So we have, so we have this, we're also picking up ridges. This is essentially what we're trying to get at here. So that's kind of as far as I could get with this before my time at UTIG ran out. And uh, so where, where does that leave us? So there's, there's three things, three main takeaways. Comparing surface echo powers as a function of aperture length. Oh, I realize I have a typo right there. Of aperture length seems to be a reliable means of identifying point like targets. It seems to work in principle, things that we expect to be point like, we can see the positive power differentials there. And the positive power differentials occur closer to mapped lava, mapped lava tubes than if they were randomly distributed. That's kind of what we wanted to see. However, those positive power differentials also exhibit a, sp a strong spatial association to top topographic ridges as extracted from MOLA. So there's a bunch of these, you would almost call them false positives, where we don't, there's been no interpretation of a lava tube at that location. There's a ridge. Is that ridge, and it seems to be in line with a lava tube, is that ridge a just a unmapped lava tube or is it not? It's still not incredibly clear. And I think the complex morphology of the, these lava tubes in the Western Albamans region make a robust assessment of, the, of method viability difficult because they, the lava tubes look like ridges. We can't really separate, are we seeing ridges or are we seeing lava tubes? We're seeing ridges because they're lava tubes or lava tubes because they're ridges. That's kind of the, the problem. And I think uh, what I really like to do is look for other locations where we do have more of a, what we, what we thought would be more of a typical lava tube morphology, like more uh, pit chains as opposed to these um, collapsed ridges or volcanic ridges. Because then we could say, okay, our surface is pretty flat, hopefully find a nice, or we can find a place with a nice flat surface or flat earth surface doesn't have as many ridges and then we can actually nail or go a little bit deeper into the uh, kind of the subsurface scattering and if we can follow these things but um, yes so there's still work to go um, but yeah that's uh, all I have prepared uh, thank you everybody for listening and uh, a lot of thanks to the center for giving me the opportunity to chase down some of this like it it's it's very tantalizing these results like it does work but there, it's just, there's a little bit of a unknown bit to it still. So, yeah. And thank you everybody for listening. So if there's any questions, let me, uh, uh, I'll try my best to answer. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Kirk, uh, for this work in progress. That was very interesting. I see, do I have, do we have any questions online or raised hands? Please speak up. No worries. And we have Duncan. Duncan, a question. Um, so have you thought about any of what you could do with uh, the Chinese system that's now in orbit around Mars with its multipole capacity and different frequencies? And to be honest, I have not. It would be... I'm just like, what, so this method is very much a scattering based. So I'm not sure exactly if the multipolarization would have a huge impact. Uh, Cause these aren't gonna be conducting features. So they're not gonna behave like what we thought subglacial R channels would be. The lava tubes are probably going to be pretty insulating if they're just full with, filled with atmosphere. So, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. I haven't thought about it. I don't know much about the Chinese system. Right when it came online is when I shifted focus back to uh, Greenland. So. But no, it's a very interesting question. Uh, okay, we have another question from Natalie, which is a question I had in mind also, actually. You, you, you say that uh, you would want to look for other places where there is maybe less ridges. Uh, 
you know, to try to avoid this kind of ambiguities as much as you can. And Natalie has the question, could you actually apply this to the moon? Would that be a good target? Hmm. So I think in theory, it should work. I don't see why it wouldn't. I don't know much about the, uh, the lunar data set. Like I know, for instance, this would be very hard to do with Marsis, just because Marsis comes back uh, star focused already or pseudo star focused. So, uh, but I think the lunar data can be focused on the ground. So as long as the raw data is there, I don't see why you couldn't try it. And and it is there, yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's a good one. Now, Natalie, did you want uh, did you want to turn your questions another way, or does it answer your no, question? That yeah, that was perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you. We have a raised hand from Christopher. Hi, Kirk. Hi, everyone. Um, well, first, maybe I can uh, add a point to uh, Natalie's question, actually. Uh, there has been search for lava tubes on the moon, and um, on the moon, they actually happen to be under very smooth surfaces. And there was a paper uh, that claimed some sort of detection with the, um, with the LRS instrument, the Lunar Reader Sounder. However, the problem with that instrument is that the bandwidth is very low. And uh, so actually what they had to search for was, um, was a convolved response of something in the subsurface with something on the surface, which was very hard to, um, to uh, untie. So um, there is a detection, but it's kind of ambiguous. I think the search is still, um, is still ongoing. And actually, that brings me to my question, actually. Uh, in uh, in uh, your work, uh, Kirk, did you actually look for a subsurface signal specifically, or was it also something involved with the surface? So the main hypothesis was we were looking for essentially point targets. If they're in the subsurface or in the surface, as long they would have to be kind of close to the surface, uh, just because we like how the the picker work, we take the point of maximum SNR. So uh, yeah, it was just, we were looking for any kind of point target that would pop out in the something close to the position of, or the peak SNR. So I, why, if that's in the subsurface within the range resolution of Sherrod, um, that, that was the working hypothesis, that they're not gonna be, we're not looking for something 100 meters deep. We're looking for something just a few meters because that's what the skylights show. They're, these roofs aren't very thick. So they're not gonna, I, I don't think the idea of looking for roofs it, by um, individual reflectors is gonna work so well. Okay, so you might also be looking at um, some sort of mixed surface and subsurface response in some cases. Yeah, and but the thinking the was that not. if, yeah, the thinking was if it's a flat surface, that flat surface isn't going to have any off nader, a long track off nader scattering. So it's going to be that point target response in the subsurface from that lava tube that's going to give us the scattering that's going to pop out as the positive power differential. Okay. But if you have a surface morphology on top of that that is also point target shaped, then you have a problem. And that's what we, that's what I ran into. Yeah. And about that, actually, uh, my second question or suggestion, as the saying goes, um, is that, well, when uh, you have a reflection from a, from a material with a high, di high dielectric constant to a lower one, um, you have by Snell's law a phase, a phase inversion. Mm. And um, actually, this is something that you can see in, a, in a simulations. I mean, we put up a paper about that. The paper is wrong because the paper does not include clutter. So the, so the paper is wrong, but I read on this simulation after with with a, with a clutter, and there is still a difference um, in in the phase that you can expect if if the dielectric constant of your tube is higher or lower than the surface. In your case, it's lower since it's vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, is is that an element that uh, focused SAR Shara data can look into, or you just have really the real the real uh, power? Yeah, to be honest, I, I'm not sure exactly. The, 
Yeah, something looking at face inversions was something I thought about, but it never got past the point of me thinking about it. <laughs> I never went and tried to do anything with it. So it's a, I think it could be very interesting, and I think it's a really neat idea. I just I don't have a good sense on if I think it should be possible in the SAR focus data. Uh, I think the phase should be reliable enough. Um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, that's uh, something we can try then. Yeah. Okay, and we have a raised hand from Bill. Yeah, um, this is a question based on complete ignorance, having never at all touched uh, uh, this kind of data. And it sort of also um, builds on the previous question that you were going through and looking for these positive power anomalies. And you know, it was something that you can look in the data and see and recognize. Have you ever thought of adopting a machine learning approach where you know you will have a test set where you know that you showed us of where you know you have good reason to believe there are these um, lava tubes and you have the data going over that and letting the machine learning sort of look at what it thinks are the best indicators of this and proceed that way and it may end up finding things that that you didn't necessarily um, perceive when you you looked in in detail at the data no, that's actually, that's a really interesting idea. It's something I never, I never thought of. And it would be really neat because we, you saw some regions where we were picking up positive power difference yep. that were kind of strong, but there's nothing interpreted to be there. So right. is, are, are the interpretations foolproof? Or, or, or did they miss something? Or it's a really interesting idea to try and train it. Because you do see sometimes like, you have these interpretive lava tube segments that kind of strike in a similar direction, and then, but there's just an interpretation gap in the middle. Yeah. But you're still picking out these positive power differentials kind of along that gap. So is the thinking like, is that just, are we seeing what we thought we were seeing with these buried lava tubes that does, doesn't have a surface expression? It would be really interesting to try and see if the, uh, yeah, that's a really neat idea. I never thought. I just wanted to toss the idea out there. I don't know how much, you know, you're familiar with machine learning techniques. I know I'm not. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's actually that's a really neat idea. I might have to write that down. Thank you for the question, and uh, I have Duncan uh, again with a uh, raise hands. Yeah, just being greedy. Um, yeah. Um, so. Any reason why this would not work at nine megahertz or five megahertz of bandwidth? Uh, and what I'm talking about there is the sounding radar on Envision, which is going to Venus. Um, Venus has these long canali type features, which are presumed to be lava associated flow features, but their subsurface extent that has not really been thought about too much or worked on, constrained. I, I think, I don't see why not. It's it's just a it's a different scale of problem say with the higher the higher bandwidth of rod which is not much higher um, yeah. you're sensitive to like kind of little finer things they might have to be a little bigger for envision but radar scattering is radar scattering it's not going to change very much as you, if you can star focus the data you can see how point target like things are so Okay, thanks. I don't see why it, it couldn't work on Venus as well. I have uh, one more question for you, Kirk. Uh, what, uh, what should be the width uh, of a lava tube to trigger a detection on Sharad? That's a, that's a wide open question right there. It's something like I really wanted to do and do some kind of like uh, some forward modeling, but mm just ran out of time for it. It'd be really neat to see, because obviously they can't be super small, or otherwise it's not gonna be, they're not gonna be seen and they can't be, they're probably not super big, but you can get a sense from the uh, like pit chains and skylights. You can kind of get a sense for like how wide these things are. You can see them track through the landscape as collapse features. So you say, okay, at least I know it's about this wide, but trying to, um, put a bound on it for what Sherrod could see is a, it, it would be a very uh, useful thing to do, I think. 
I just never got around to having a forward model. And uh, I think a follow-up question is, uh, you, what, sh what should be the shape of the roof of the lab at you? you know, would, you, would you trigger detection if it's flat or do you need actually a concave shape? I don't think it has to be incredibly round. Um, I, I don't, yeah, my working, uh, my working model was always just it's round because I had no reason to think it wasn't. <laughs> um, but I don't think we're gonna have, like if you look, so at the same time I was looking through like lava tube literature on earth and they're not like, they're not boxes, they're not triangles. They're kind of maybe oblong, oval-like. So they do have a kind of a roundish shape. So uh, that's my expectation for what they should mm -hmm. be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I believe so. Um, okay. I think you, you, the, if you run into kind of like lenses, then you'll, I think you'll start, the more lens like it is, more lenticular it is, I think then you're going to start running into problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, you want something ovalish, let's put it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ovalish to round, I think would be mm -hmm. the, your best bet for trying to recover these things. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was a lot of questions, but we still have time. So, is there any other uh, questions or someone who would want to carry for? I mean, to to continue one of the discussion we already had from one of those questions. There is, uh, I think, there was this questions about uh, that was from Duncan, right? About the Chinese radar sonder on Mars, uh, which is a two frequency. Right, uh, maybe something like 13 BFRs and uh, something else. I don't really remember. Uh, do you know, Kirk, if this data set is going to be uh, open to the public? I, I don't know. Yeah, me neither. I honestly, I have not paid attention to that radar since I, except like when it got there, I was like, ooh, that's neat. And then that's the last I've been able to think about it. <laughs> I so, that, that's neat, but that's that's basically it so far. We don't have yeah. much information. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. If if uh, I were, if I I might be going out on a limb here, but if I remember, they said it would be published data, but or not published, but like uh, archive data that's accessible. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. I have not followed up on it. Yeah. 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 That's um, so. That's I okay. also ask a question, if I could. So, sorry. I, 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 Go ahead, David. I cut, it, cut in. One of the, we saw, some of us saw a talk fairly recently on uh, uh, collapsed lava tubes on the moon and the radiative transfer calculations of how warm they are inside. And I guess I was surprised, but I think they're right that they, they're kind of warm. They come to sort of a black body temperature and so therefore they would not be a place to collect volatiles but if you is that is there any reason to think that you might find volatiles actually collected in the martian lava tubes that would change that would become visible in terms of you know their dielectric properties i guess the volatiles of interest would be carbon dioxide or water yeah, I, I don't, oh, I'm trying to think back. I've seen a couple of papers that have modeled or that have looked at the kind of plumbing of some of these hypothetical systems. And if you could, what type of at atmosphere you would have inside of these lava tubes. And I can't remember exactly what they were finding for volatiles. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Maybe thinking out loud and maybe Cyril can correct me if they're kind of high enough latitude wise, maybe you could get some CO2 frost stuck in there and doing some other things, but I don't think it's going to be like a large amount of it. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's a good question because I don't know actually the thermal dynamic, you know, and state of the, within those lava tubes. Uh, 
what at, at, I can say is by, based on terrestrial analogs, uh, at least those lava tubes, well, they are more or less considered to try to find a, uh, uh, an active habitat, I would say. And, but they are also considered to try to find relict, uh, you know, a relict of an unscient habitat of unscient, uh, an unscient biosphere, because actually uh, within the lava, the lava tube is, is protected from radiations, you know, so uh, any kind of uh, micro fossil uh, might be preserved uh, better here than, than at the surface. Even if you do not have uh, volatiles or the volatiles are gone. Um, I'm wondering, in terms of temperature dynamic and state, you know, there is, uh, it's the Martian atmosphere, but it's a kind of a lava tube, it's, a, it's kind of closed environment, you know. So, in terms of uh, water pressure saturation, we might not reach saturation, but we might have a higher humidity rate inside. And that might also help to try to 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 keep volatiles in, in terms of uh, some state. Okay, okay uh, still have ten minutes, but we had actually extensive discussions. So, uh, any other questions pending? I I think I am good on the chat. There is no one else with raised hands. I have one for you, Cyril, or anybody else who might know this, because I've been out of the loop for a couple odd months. But just the uh, decadal survey that came out a couple weeks ago, I took a brief look through it. I What happened to that kind of Pathfinder water finder radar thing? The, I can't remember what it was called. The uh, I'm in International Mars Ice Mapper. I, oh, I the International Mars Ice Mapper. Okay, so that's uh, yeah, that's so the International Mars Ice Mapper is a concept, an international concept for mission uh, who would characterize a landing site on Mars, a landing site for a human, uh, a human landing. You know, so it means characterizing the. Uh, the geo properties of the, of the of the surface in terms of load bearing, for example, to find to try to find uh, ice uh, ice deposits uh, near this landing site, uh, right? And this is why it is called the International Mars Ice Mapper. And and uh, there is, I mean, the activity is going on right now to try to do to make a trace matrix, a requirement trace matrix for this mission. And just so the decadal survey has been released uh, a bit more than a month ago right now, right, or something, a month ago. And few days, or so maybe a week before that, NASA say that they won't support any more spending on this concept, mm. right? However, in the decadal survey, there is, um, there is, uh, in the survey, there is an important support for this kind of mission. You know, uh, it's hard to say how much, you know, they they knew the position of each other between NASA and the Decadar survey because that was, that, that, there's a disconnect, right? So it's kind of a very open question now because through the Decadar survey, the community say that this is an important mission, but NASA doesn't want to spend more money. Um, uh, it is, the Congress didn't, I mean, they didn't state about this right now. It's going to be in the following months. But it's an international mission. There is the Canadian Space Agency, there is the Japanese Space Agency, uh, the Italian Space Agency also in those missions. And they want to use also these missions for their own, uh, for their own programmatic goals, you know, and also as a, a kind of technology showcasing, you know, of their capabilities. So there's a lot of at stake here. You know, and uh, it might not take the form that was, this mission might not take the form that was expected a year ago, but it might be revived at some point in another, in another way with those different collaborations. And, uh, uh, but I, I, at this moment in time, it's really hard to tell when and how. <laughs> okay. Actually. That's kind of the gist of what I got. I just wanted to. Just I'll, I'll also ask because I'm pretty sure there was a P band radar on it, wasn't there? Yes, there is. Uh, so right now the Stroman payload is a uh, 330 megahertz 
uh, radar and SAR. So radar sonder and SAR. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are actually discussing right now whether or not we would want to add an additional instrument to this payload in order to achieve our goals that we are defining right now. So mm -hmm. the, the, the report should be out uh, in hopefully this summer, I believe. No, I think. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay, no, no more questions? Sounds good. So, uh, Kirk, thank you very much for these presentations. Uh, we generated, uh, uh, as I mean, discussions as long as the, 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 the talk itself, so it's pretty good. And uh, we hope you the best in Denmark to, to learn Danish. Yes, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> it's, it's slow, <laughs> but... Yes. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and uh, chatting. It was really nice. It's nice to get Goodbye. off of Earth sometimes. Thank you. Take care.